Um, I'd like to introduce um, myself. I'm Tamara and I'm with Elderworks. And our presenter today is Donna Adams. And she is presenting uh, the topic, optimizing social security benefits, one of the most important retirement decisions you will make. Uh, just a reminder that we're, this event is being recorded and it's going to be on Facebook. Let's see, I have a chat here. Okay, great, great. You can, all can hear me, thank you. Um, Elderworks Educational Services is a non-for-profit 501c3 corporation whose mission is to provide older adults, seniors, families, information, referrals, and guidance for senior living, home care, and supportive services to help make the appropriate decisions. This includes education on senior topics for community members and professionals. The guidance we provide will help seniors stay at home or transition successfully into a new senior housing opportunity. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please use the question and answer button on your screen to ask questions. Please note that you will be muted during the presentation. After the webinar, a short survey will pop up on your screen. We would really appreciate your feedback on how we're doing. So with that, I'd like to introduce Donna Adams and welcome Donna and thank you for today's event. Thank you, Tamara. And thank you everyone for taking time out of your schedule to come and listen to this presentation today. Um, one of the things, these are disclaimers that I have to put up because I'm, um, I'm a certified financial planner, but one of the things that you need to know that Social Security is going to uh, be one of the most important retirement decisions you make in your life. So with that, <clears throat> um, we're going to review optimizing Social Security benefits today because there's a lot of um, moving parts when you go to claim Social Security. And if I can help you understand some of that, then I've accomplished my mission for today. So let's, um, let's get started a little bit. What I'm gonna review is I'm gonna review the retirement landscape. What did retirement used to look like? And how, what does it look like today? And I'm gonna go over some basic benefits, very basic benefits. And, uh, but before I actually hit the benefits, you have to understand the rules and regulations of Social Security. And then some additional aspects to consider and how to optimize taxes and things like that. And then answer the most biggest question that's on everybody's mind is, is Social Security gonna be there when I retire? And then what uh, I'm gonna help you understand what an integrated retirement plan looks like and why it's important when you start um, preparing for retirement. So let's look at the retirement landscape. As I mentioned, we're gonna take a look to see what retirement used to look like and what it looks like today. So retirement then and now. When you used to retire at age 65, if you remember um, maybe your parents or your grandparents when, when they retired, they would get a gold watch, a pension, uh, health benefits for life, all kinds of things, a nice big retirement party and things like that. Well, that was back then, and back then isn't today. So now it's gotten very complicated. And why is it complicated? Because there's, a, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of moving parts. The full retirement age has changed and it is it is continuing to change. So I would hope that you understand some of these basics. One of the things that we have to look, remember, is that back when you know maybe uh, my parents retired, my grandparents retired, the um, life expectancy was 61 years old. So when they retired at age 65, and all of a sudden they passed away, and you always heard your aunts or uncles or neighbors saying, "Man, you shouldn't have retired. It just killed them." Well, the reason is they it, retirement didn't kill them. They lived four years past their life expectancy. So it was normal for, for that to happen. In today's environment, a male's life expectancy is age 87 and a female is age 89. So when you think about that, you have to think about, wow, what does that do to my retirement income? Because now you have to have it last much longer than you did in the past. So that comes into play here when you're trying to figure out your retirement plan. So retirement income, we kind of use this financial three-legged stool that we look at. 
um, the, the legs of the stool are, you used to have a pension. Some people still do, but very few. And then you get your social security benefits. And then you also would get income from your personal savings, your retirement accounts, your bank accounts, your CDs, and things like that. Well, what's happening today is more and more employers have shifted from defined benefits plans, which were your uh, pension plans, to defined contribution plans, which is your 401ks. So they're actually moved the, the responsibility from the employer to the employee. And a lot of people don't realize how important it is to start saving for their retirement through the employer plans. Um, and another thing that's really important to realize here is most of you know how much money you have in your bank account and can figure about how much money you're going to have to retire on, but I, it's hard for people to figure out what's their income going to be in retirement based on that money, because that pot of money that you've saved along with your social security benefits has to last you 25, 30 years now. So that becomes a very, very important thing to think about. So let's go over some of the basics here. And this is really, really important. Um, Social Security is complicated and uh, th there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of rules and regulations. And as I mentioned earlier, if I can help you understand some of the basics, I've done my job for today. Because you see what happens when you go to the Social Security board, and apply for your social security, they have mandates that they cannot help you make any decisions when to take your social security, um, how much are you gonna get for social security? All, they cannot help you with those questions. So that's why it's important to understand a little bit about the basics because sometimes when you don't understand, you can be left looking like this, you know, like, what am I going to do? Who's there to help me? So uh, let's look at some of the basics here and see what's going on. So we'll start with how it works. If you're working, you contribute 6.2% of your earnings to Social Security. And if you are working for an employer, that's deducted out of your paycheck every week or every pay period. But if you're self-employed, you have to contribute 12.4%. Why? Because you pay half, your employer pays half. But now if you are the employee and the employer, you have to pay both parts of it. So it can get a little expensive. Once you hit um, $137,700, um, you no longer have to pay into Social Security. <clears throat> And that 137,700 is your your income. So it's you know if you divide that by 12, then you're going to pay. But if you make over that, you're not going to pay any more into your Social Security benefits. So let's take a look here at the key factors that um, help you understand how your benefits, what you're going to receive. It's done by your earnings history. <clears throat> when you claim, what age you claim at, and they also take into consideration your longevity. And that becomes really important because you have to know uh, what's going on there. And then the way to qualify is you have to contribute to Social Security for 40 quarters. So in other words, 10 years, because you get one point per quarter. So um, in a year, you can gain four points. But if your, uh, your spouse worked and contributed to Social Security for 10 years also, um, you can earn up to four credits a year. So the, the, the key here is, is that you have to work at least 10 years to qualify for Social Security. And those don't need to be uh, consecutive years. That I should point that out. But let's look at our full retirement age now. Our full retirement age, uh, also used as FRA, full retirement age, you uh, used to be 65. If you were born between before 1943, your full retirement age is 65. But after that, if you were born between 1943 and 1954, your full retirement age is now 66. So every year after that, it went up two months. So if you were born in 1955, it's 66 in two months. So in other words, if you were 66 in January, March is your... Um, your full retirement age. 
All right, and then they added two months every uh, every year until your um, birth date of 1960, and they've made the full retirement age now 67. So that's the way it's working right now. And so a full retirement age for anyone that was born after 1960 or after your full retirement age is 67. The PIA is what we call the primary in insurance amount. And that's the amount of the benefit that you're gonna receive at full retirement age. So how do they calculate this? What do they do? The first thing they do is they take 35 years of your highest years of earning. So if you've worked more than 10 years, and as I mentioned earlier, it's not consecutive, they will take 35 years of your highest years of earning and they'll take an average of that. So they'll take all of those earning um, amounts and then they're going to divide them by 35 and that's how your benefit is calculated. Now, if you didn't work 35 years, say you only worked uh, 20 years, for those other uh, 10 years or 15 years that aren't accounted for, you get a zero. So, but they're still going to divide it by 35. So that's going to lower your benefit. So that's how benefits are calculated. And that's why not many people have the same benefit coming in. So what do you do when it's time to elect your benefits? You can claim your benefits as soon as you reach age 62. That's called early retirement age. And you will get a minimum benefit. It's, and then when you, if you wait until you turn full retirement age, it's either going to be um, 66 or 66 in a few months, or then once you, it's 67, that's your full benefit amount. And that's where you get that full benefit of that math that I just explained on the previous slide. Um, but if you delay your retirement until age 70, your benefits are going to increase and they're going to increase quite a bit. And I've got some examples here to help you understand that. Um, so the biggest question you have is when should you file? And, and that's, a, that's a really difficult question for most people because you just don't know. And if you go to the social security um, website, you can pull a report of what your amounts are as of today um, for the minimum, the full and the increased benefits. So that can help also. <clears throat> but what you have to look here is if you are, um, there, there's also taxes that are gonna be held so if you're taking benefits and working, if you're below the full retirement um, year, you'll get, uh, if you make more than $18,240 a year, $1 of benefits is withheld for every $2 of earning that's above the limit. So if you uh, come right in at $18,240 salary for that year, none of your social security is gonna be taxed. But if you're over it, it's $1 is gonna be withheld for every $2 above that. So if you make $18,241 um, or $42, you just lost a dollar of your benefit. But if you wait to your full year of retirement you, and you're still working, you can make up to $48,600 a year. And now they're only gonna withhold $1 for every $3 of earnings um, of that, you, that you make above that full retirement age. But now if you waited, if you remember that chart, that chart I showed you just a little bit earlier about every year that add two months. So if your full retirement age is 66 and two months, if you wait those two months before you actually start your retirement income or your social security income, you, you can work as much as you want and none of those benefits are gonna be, gonna be withheld. All right, so that's really important to understand. All right, so let's look at what we call here the power of patience. So if you're age 62, 63, 64, 65, the, this is a monthly benefit that they just calculated to be paid out. And the percent of your primary insurance amount, as you can see, is reduced. It's 75%, 80%, 86.7, 93.3. .3. So there's really no rhyme or rhythm there on what the government's doing on how they figure out 
uh, what your primary insurance amount is going to be. But if you wait until your full retirement age, again, that's when you receive your primary insurance amount. And so what's going on here is that now you're getting your full retirement benefit at $1,600 a, um, a, a month. So that really helps out. But then when you actually look at it, if you look at age 67, 68, 69, and 70, which is past your full retirement age, the increase is about 8% a year. So if you can wait be, until age 70, that's when you're going to receive the most benefit from Social Security. And there really isn't any reason to go beyond age 70 because you will not get any more money. So that's where they, they cap it off. And that would be if you go from $1,200 to $2,112, that's about a 76% increase in your monthly, pre in monthly benefits. So that's something to really take into consideration. So let's look at also one of the things that happen is when you get those benefits, they're saying here the average Social Security benefit is $1,503 a month but it includes a 1.6 cost of living adjustment. And they call that the COLA. So if you ever hear anyone say, what's the COLA? That's what they mean as cost of living adjustment. The maximum social security benefit that anyone can receive claiming at age 62 is $2,265. If you wait to your full retirement age, then the maximum would be $3,011. And if you wait to age 70, the maximum you can claim is $37.90. So that becomes important also because some people don't hit those maximum limits and that's why you've got the average of uh, 1503, but still it's something to consider. And these numbers are based for, uh, for 2020, so they can change. Um, you never know what the new numbers are gonna be. So now that you understand a little bit of the basics of social security, Let's look at some of the benefits and how they work. The most common one is the worker benefit, all right? And that's the one that we just I just explained. It's your traditional Social Security benefit. And as I mentioned, it's based on the 35 years of your highest earnings. Um, that'll be inflation adjusted also. But if you um, claim before your full retirement age, as I mentioned earlier, they're gonna be reduced. If you claim after your full retirement age, they're going to be increased. So that's, um, that's something that I've already explained, but let's look at what's going on here. Not only do you have your normal social security benefits, but there's also something out there that's called a spousal benefit. So a spouse, whether it is a current spouse or an ex-spouse, is entitled to 50% of their spouse's um, primary insurance amount when that person achieves their full retirement age. So in other words, it, it, let's just use me as an example. When I turned 66, that would be my full retirement age, I can collect half of my spouse's social security and not mine if I get more income from him. Okay, so if, if, if his social security is higher at 50%, I could collect his half of his social security. However, he already has to be on social security before this works. If they're not on social security, it's not going to work. Um, but it permanent, permanently re reduces if you claim it before your full retirement age. So it can happen. Um, so you'll get less than the 50% if you decide to claim it before your full retirement age. And once you hit your full retirement age, there is no reason to wait to age 70 to do this because full retirement age is the number they stop at. They don't give you an increase if you wait to age 70 on this benefit. So as I mentioned just a little bit ago, there's an ex-spousal benefit that's out there. And there are some qualifications, there's some rules and regulations for that. One thing you have to understand with the Social Security uh, Board is there's rules, there's exceptions to rules, and there's exceptions to the exceptions. So you really have to understand a little bit about what's going on with Social Security. 
So the qualifications here are you have to be um, unmarried, 62 or older, married for at least 10 years, and divorced for two. So in other words, you have to be married for at least 10 years, you have to be at least age 62, and you have to be divorced for two years, but you can't be remarried here. All right, that's the key is you cannot be remarried. And so with this, you're entitled to 50% of the ex ex's retirement benefit <clears throat> and 100% of the ex's survivor benefit. So in other words, if your ex-spouse is deceased, you can now collect 100% of that benefit. Um, there is no impact on the ex-spouse um, or current spouse at all. So in other words, if, if you're divorced and you decide your ex-spouse, you can get more income if you claim his social security, he does not get affected from it. So his social security is his social security. It's not like you're taking half away from him or her. Um, he still will get his full benefit and you will get half of that benefit, but it doesn't affect them. And if you remarried after 60, you're still eligible for ex-spouse survivor benefits. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of rules here. There's a lot of things that um, people just don't realize that's out there. A lot, you would not, you would be amazed at how much social security money is left on the table because people just don't understand these benefits are out there. Another one is the ex-spousal um, ex benefits multiple marriage case. So let's take a look at this so that you can better understand how um, Social Security affects your decision. So Claire was 57 years old. She was a teacher making $40,000 a year. Um, she had inconsistent career earnings <clears throat> and Claire's uh, paid up in uh, insurance amount is $850, all right? So now Greg, which is Claire's first husband, they divorced after 15 years. So they met that first requirement of at least married for 10. And then Greg deceased, all right? And Greg's primary insurance amount was $1,250. <clears throat> and then you have Steve. Steve um, is Claire's second husband. And she divorced him after 11 years. And Steve's primary insurance amount is $800, right? So people would think that, wow, um, if I can get half of Steve's, it makes sense because he's the highest uh, Social Security benefit here. But let's take a real look at what goes on here. <clears throat> All right, so there's Claire's primary insurance amount. 850, and she gets 100% of that retirement benefit because she waited to her full retirement age. And there's Greg's primary insurance amount, but guess what? Claire is entitled to 100% of that because he is deceased, right? And then you look again at Steve's. Well, as I mentioned, she can only get 900 of Steve's because she can only collect 50% on the ex-spousal benefit, where here she can collect 100% on the survivor benefit. So uh, it makes more sense for her to claim Steve's, or Gre I'm sorry, Greg's Social Security here. Okay, so... There's also what we call widow, widower, survivor benefits. That name is interchangeable, but you'll hear it used way many different ways. And um, that, that's if you're a, a survivor of a spouse that has passed away. And you can start claiming this as young as age 60, but your benefits are going to be permanently reduced. You're entitled to 100% of the DLC spouse benefit at your full retirement age just as in that example that I showed you the slide before. But <clears throat> then there's one more that becomes very, very important, and that's this available benefit for children. And that is very, very interesting. A lot of people don't understand that that one's out here. Um, if you are unmarried, 
and you have a child 18 years or under who is legally dependent, you can collect 50% of a benefit if the parent is the legal guardian is living, right? Or 75% of the uh, parent or legal guardian is deceased. So you can collect social security on that children. Now, who's eligible for that? Biological children, stepchildren, adopted children, grandchild, step-grandchild. You might be thinking to yourself, well, how does this work? One of the examples that I can use is I, um, I have a neighbor and um, their younger daughter um, got pregnant and she is disabled. So she cannot take care of that child. She's living with them herself. So uh, what they did was <clears throat> they went to court and they got full guardianship of their grandchild. So there you go, there's a grandchild coming into play. So the key here is, is that the parent or legal guardian has to be on social security themselves. So what they can do here is if um, they were able to claim once the grandfather started collecting social security, they were able to claim um, their now grandchild, they're able to get 50% of his social security benefit for the grandchild. So say he makes, uh, he gets $3,000 social security, he gets 3,000 and now he gets 1,500 for the grandchild. Well, it goes one step further. The grandmother who has never worked and never put anything into play here can also collect 50% of the, the grandfather's social security. So now that's an extra $1,500 on her. So now they're up to $6,000 a month. But there's one more step here. The child who is on disability can also collect some social security money. So they're collecting quite a bit of money on social security just because of this one situation. What a great college funding plan for that grandchild, right? So you do have to understand some of the, the benefits that are going here, going on here. There's one more, which is the younger parent benefit. And this one here, how this one works is if you have a, a, a married couple and one of the parents is already collecting social security and the younger parent is not young enough, is too young to start collecting social security, that younger parent can now collect 50% of the older parent's social security benefit. So that's a nice way also to just bring in some additional income when you're considering social security. Now, there are some rules and regulations for the, for the government workers, teachers, law enforcement, firefighters, government employees. They typically have a pension and most of the time, they are told, well, because you have a pension, you cannot collect social security. Not so true, all right? Because there are ways and there are some situations where you can collect social security. There are two rules of uh, elimination going on here. One is called the windfall elimination period, WEP. You'll see that a lot when you start working with social security information and reading documents on it. And that basically is going to impact your own Social Security benefit because you are the government employee. So it could reduce your benefits. It could uh, give you zero benefits. I don't want you to walk away here thinking, oh, I get Social Security even though I'm a government employee. No, that's not the case. It has to be reviewed and there might be situations where you do not qualify for Social Security. But then you also have to understand if you're a government employee, they, there's another thing that's called the government pension offset, and that really affects the spouse, all right? So the spouse could be entitled to some Social Security or not. Again, it's an equation from the Social Security Board, but it was something that I just wanted to touch on, very limited because it's very, very involved um, to get this to work for you, but I just wanted to at least let you know that there is some um, sometimes where you can collect Social Security even though you're a government worker. So don't just take that, 
the um, the advice of people saying because you work for the government, you cannot. There are some situations where you can. One of the other things to remember with Social Security, as I mentioned earlier, is that COLA. Well, that is um, calculated once a year. So, and the reason for that is it really is the cost of living increase. All right, so it's your um, just an increase for inflation and things like that going on. So um, in 2018, we had a 2% increase in the Social Security benefits. In 2019, we had a 2.8% increase. And in 2020, everyone that was collecting Social Security got a 1.6 increase. And it also, even though you weren't collecting Social Security, it also increased your um, available benefits when you do actually collect Social Security. So this is going on inside of your Social Security account before and during um, collecting the Social Security benefit. What it's going to be for 2021, I don't know that answer yet, but I also want you to understand that these aren't mandatory. Sometimes there can be a zero increase, so that's important to understand also. So now let's look at the taxation of Social Security benefits. So as I mentioned earlier, you've got where they're going to reduce uh, some of your uh, income benefit if you go over a certain income level. But how is that also going to affect your taxes of Social Security benefits? So what they do is they take, this is a combined income of adjusted gross income, so your bottom line tax number when you file your taxes your tax exempt income, so income that you get that you might not have to pay taxes on, um, and a half of your social security benefit. So that's the, the uh, equation that they use. <clears throat> but let's look at this here. So if um, you're single or you're married and filing jointly, 0% of your ben benefits are taxed. All right but up to 50% of your benefits are taxable if you made more than $2,500 or $3,200 filing jointly. And 34% um, for single and 44,000 for joint is gonna be taxed at 85% of the benefit is gonna be taxed. So let's look at how this really works. This helps you understand what that slide just said. So Mark, his Social Security is $18,000. Amy's Social Security is $15,000. Mark has a pension of $25,000. Mark has an IRA distribution, uh, required minimum distributions, or he might just be taking systematic withdrawals that doesn't really explain it here. And Amy's taken an IRA distribution of $12,000. So their total annual income uh, at retirement is $80,000. That's not bad, you know, they're doing good. But how is this gonna be taxed? So let's look at this. Remember I said they look at 50% of your social security. So not all of that comes over to this bucket. They only look at 50% of it. But then they also look at um, Mark's pension, IRA distribution, and then Amy's uh, IRA distribution. So now they've got 63,500 of combined income. So reduce the taxable amount a little bit because the, uh, of the social security benefits being cut in half. So they went from the taxable amount from 80,000 now to 635. But how is that actually taxed? How much are you is actually gonna be taxable? Well, the first, we're looking at is uh, married filing jointly. So the first $32,000 is not taxed at all, right? Um, and then the 32,001 to 44,000, they have 50% that's going to be taxed. Um, so that's gonna be $6,000 of taxable income from social security. And then if you make more than that $44,000, which is the 19.5, so when you add these all up, you're gonna come up with that uh, thirty-six or $63,000 number, that's gonna be taxed at 85% um, of your social security benefits are taxed. So that gives you $16,575 that are taxed for a total amount of $22,575 
that is taxable income when you do your income tax returns. So I know that gets a little in depth, but again, um, I just wanted to touch base on that so that you understand that Social Security is taxable. Some people think it's not, but in today's world, it is. So now let's take a look at that big question. Is it going to be there when I retire? Everybody really, really is concerned about that. Um, it, it, I mean, you hear it all the time in the news. Social Security is just not going to be there. Well, let's look at what's going on. Just for the record here, Social Security in 2035 um, will probably run out of money. Why? Because what happened was, is that um, they started drawing down their trust fund, right? And so because they're drawing down that trust fund, they feel there's enough money in that trust fund to be able to pay Social Security benefits to the year 2035. But that's not the whole story here, because what's happening is there's probably 80% um, in there for paying uh, Social Security benefits out. And where is that coming from? It's coming from people that are, can, are still working. They're, it's coming from the employees that are paying into Social Security. So that's gonna make up for about 80% of the Social Security benefits. So when you weigh out that they really only need about 20% to, um, from, to draw from that trust fund, you're more than likely gonna have Social Security there for a very, very long time. It is probably never going to go away. Why? Because if they see that happening, there's some solutions. The government makes the rules, right? So they have, there's some solutions that they can look at. One of them is, is they can increase the social security tax rate and, uh, or they can do higher maximum earnings amounts subject to social security taxes so that that can come into that fund. They can increase the full retirement age, which we've seen. Now we went from 65 to 67 um, and they can increase the benefits. I mean, they don't have to pay off those, those, that full benefit amount. Again, that cost of living adjustment, the COLAs, they can reduce or not give that, or they can do some of all of the above. So is the, so, the dynamics of the social security benefits going to change? Yes. Is it going to go away? No. That they're not going to let that happen. So don't mark my word. You never know what the future brings us, right? So as I mentioned earlier, um, once you make a, a, a decision, it's irrevocable. So uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is don't rush to collect your Social Security with the mindset it's not going to be there if I don't take it right now because it will be there. Because if you claim early, you cannot change your mind. You've got one year to do it. Um, and reversal within one year means reimbursing Social Security for what they've already given you. So if you decide, oh, you know what, I think I'm gonna wait. Uh, I'm you know, not quite sure I made the right decision here. Any money that they've handed out to you already has to be reimbursed to them. And then after a year, you cannot change it at all. There's just no going back. So make sure that you, uh, you understand the decision here and how important it is to make sure you're making the right decision. Um, you may be able to increase your benefit beginning at full retirement age through suspension. And that's another rule and regulation that's out there that really gets involved. So I, I really don't think we have the time to explain it. And I would only walk through it with somebody if they feel that they might be in that suspension period, which there are a few people that, that can be. So let's look at what an integrated retirement means, because as I mentioned earlier, about 40% of your income is in retirement is going to come from Social Security. So what's going to make up that other 60% of your retirement? Well, it's your Social Security and then your other income sources that we talked about earlier, your 401ks, your IRAs, your savings accounts, your CDs. You might even sell some property, you know, to um, get some extra cash in your account so you can use that for Social Security. But one of the things you need to remember is that you have to use an integrated approach for your retirement income so that you can actually um, work your way up the top of the mountain and back down the mountain. And what do I mean by that? 
When you're saving for retirement, think of it as your accumulation phase and you're climbing up to the top of the mountain. And then when you're actually in retirement and starting to take money out of your retirement funds, that's when we say you're going down the mountain. You're, you know, you're, you're declining down the mountain and you're actually taking money out of those accounts. Um, an integrated approach can uh, include things like optimizing your social security benefits, looking at when it is the best time to take that social security, or are you eligible for some of those other benefits that I mentioned? Or you can use um, guaranteed lifetime income. That's huge, you know, to um, actually work with some guaranteed products that are out there in investments. Because see, what happens is, is that if you don't have some guarantees coming in on your retirement income, you can run out of money because remember, we have to make that money last 25, 30 years from now. So it's really important to, when you put a plan together, to look at those types of things. And you also have to make sure that you have access to liquidity because if you don't have liquidity, that can be a, a real problem there for you. Um, because say you have an emergency or something comes up and you need some extra cash, you need to have some type of saving somewhere that you can attack to, to get at that because it could be very hard to get a loan from a bank when you're not working. So, um, And then the most important thing is that you have to make sure that you prepare for your health care needs and costs because those can get quite costly. And as you age, you might need some additional health uh, health needs and you just never know that what's going to be uh, happen to you and your health as you age. So that's always important also is how are you going to pay those, those medical bills. So one of the things I do to help you make this decision is I do a free social security and retirement income analysis and I don't charge for it but it's some software that I use that I can actually uh, put your numbers in and answer a few health questions and things like that. And it can, it spits out a report that tells us um, what the, the best age to apply for your social security benefit is. And it, it'll show you the differences. If you apply early, this is what you're gonna make. If you apply full retirement age, this is what you're gonna make. And um, if you wait until age 70, this is what you're going to make. But it really will bring into consideration all these other benefits that we looked at to see if you're eligible for some of those. And that's what really helps you when, we, when this uh, retirement income analysis is done for you. And with that, I will say thank you for your time and we can open it up for questions. Thank you, Donna. Do we have some questions? Donna, I thought it was really informative. I learned a lot. I Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. No questions from the participants today? Okay, well, I wanna thank everyone for attending. And I know Donna would be happy. Oh wait, is there, a, wait, I think I might have a question here. Uh, wonderful presentation, thank you. That comes from, Lud I'm not sure if I can say her name correctly, Ludima Damila. Thank you. Thank you. As I mentioned, I hope that I gave you some understanding of everything that's out there. And if you think for any reason that you uh, might qualify for some of those, make sure you inquire about it. Just if you go to the Social Security Board and ask them those questions, they can help you. But they're not going to ask you the questions. Were you married before? Do you have any disabled children? They're not going to ask you those questions. But if you bring the situation to them, then they can help you. That's a really good point. I had a friend that went through that. Um, Sandy here says she will connect with you, Donna, afterwards, privately. That's fine. I'd be more than happy to answer any additional questions.
And Karen says it was informative and she thanks us too. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Colleen's question, am I understanding that social security will be taxed if I am working after the age of 70? Yes. Based on that income. Okay. And then Vanessa asked, is it possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint? I can talk to my compliance department and see. If I can, I will definitely send it off to you, Vanessa. The other thing to remember is it's um, for that previous question about is it taxed if you're still working? It's not just employment income that makes it taxable. It is um, it's income from other sources. So if you if you are uh, retired or you're collecting income from anything, because if you're set, once you turn 70 and a half, you have to start, start taking those uh, requirement minimum distribution amounts. Even though you're still working, you have to take those. So those add into your income and your taxable amount. So just keep that in mind. It's not just income from employment. Also, there was a question. This will be on Facebook. And so it is a, you're able to view it again. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, I want to remind you, you're going to be getting a survey. We really would appreciate you filling it out so we can see how we're doing. So if that's no more questions, then I'm going to say thank you, Donna, again. And um, we will go ahead and sign off. Great. Thank you, everyone.